Um, we're delighted this evening. Welcome to all. It's a beautiful evening. Welcome to the Libraries. Delighted to host an author who's written a fascinating and authentic insight into one of the city's most famous landmarks. Dr. Rory Sweetman is a professional New Zealand historian with a degree in history from Trinity College Dublin and a doctorate from Peterhouse, Cambridge. He was born in Ireland and he has lived in Dunedin since 1997. He teaches modern Irish history at the University of Otago and is published widely on New Zealand's ethnic and religious past. His works include Bishop in the Dock, The Sedition Trial of James Liston, published by Auckland University Press in 1997, A Fair and Just Solution, which is a history of the integration of private schools in New Zealand, Dunmore Press, 2002. Hello, welcome. And Faith and Fraternalism, A History of the Hibernian Society in New Zealand, 1869 to 2000, published <coughs> by the Hibernian Society in 2002. You had a busy year in 2002, didn't you? And of course, his latest book, Above the City, A History of Otago Boys High School, 1863 to 2013, published towards the end of last year. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Rory Swinton. Thanks so much, Kay. I, I think we, uh, there was a lecture and I thought that this would be a little more, a little less formal. I haven't particularly prepared um, a talk that uh, by a script, which is, I think, the first time I've ever not spoken to a script. I often pretend that I'm not, but I've always got to say from it. So, apart from a few headings, um, I think we can just sort of wing it, and I'll try and speak uh, at a good volume, but if anyone has a little trouble hearing, um, then just start waving frantically at me, and I'll get the message. So, um, I've just been away for a month. Uh, in Auckland, as I mentioned earlier to those who are here, and so I haven't really had time to prepare much, but I've also given a couple of talks and a launch speech on the Tower Boys, and I figured that some of the people here at least would have been there. I don't want to go over all that again, although it's worth having a quick flick through the colour photographs because it's useful to have illustrations and we can talk about them. But what I thought I'd do as a novelty, is, is look at the book from the back to the front. And um, uh, partly because no one has uh, uh, mentioned any of the appendices, which we very carefully chosen, and I thought I would run into lots of trouble with, but um, we can mention them a little bit today. Um, and one of the bonuses of, of uh, starting from the back is that you get to the index first, which is, of course, the most important uh, part of the book to one or two people in this room. <laughs> No so, the, the back cover, the book itself, I suppose, I mean, uh, I, I think that it's an extraordinarily, um, it's remarkable and the school should take some pride in the fact that it's a Dunedin publication. Apart from the binding, which was done in Levin, everything, the writing, the editing, the indexing, the, the book design and the printing is a Dunedin-based and accomplished uh, fact, and that's very unusual in a big book. Mm -hmm. It cost a bit more. Um, it, 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 this book uh, should really cost twice what it's being charged for, mm -hmm. it, but the, a, a generous benefactor from Macau stumped up uh, a large amount of money to pay for most of the costs. So, um, that said, uh, I suppose the back cover, um, it, feel free to grab a copy if you haven't got one or to look at your neighbours because there are a few floating around. Um, the four of 500 illustrations, so um, you know, I, ne I didn't think for a moment I'd get away with 500 illustrations, but alone 500 pages, but, or 160,000 words, but the school was worth it, the story was worth it, the sources sustained it, and eventually, the school was prepared to publish it, and um, uh, I'm hoping that eventually uh, that people will read it. You know, uh, with uh, the jury's out on that. We've only had one review in the ODT, but there ha there are review copies at, with the listener and using the books, and I'm hoping we will hear a bit more about the book as the year goes on. But the, the, the photographs were very carefully chosen. Christine Lewis, the book designer, and I consulted over them, and Austin G, the editor. Uh, so it was very much a collaborative project. I, I get all the blame, I got most of the money, but in my uh, honest moments I have to confess that the book is very much the, the, the style and the 
the beauty of the book uh, owes a lot more to other other hands than to mine. But the the um, the photographs are marvellous. Um, a, a little bonus getting a a, a very early one of a, a, a group of hostel boys from 1914. Um, I would have had that on the cover, but for the good fortune of discovering Peter McIntyre's painting of Dunedin in 1946, painted, commissioned by the Dunedin City Council as a gift to the Edinburgh City Council. So that's where the painting now hangs, in the Dunedin room of the Edinburgh City Council building. And I had a couple of mid, uh, late night, mid, middle of the night phone calls to the uh, Edinburgh people before they'd um, give me permission to uh, reproduce it at Tim Scan. And then I had to, of course, talk then with the son of Peter McIntyre, uh, Simon in Auckland, who gave permission also. But I, I love the way it wraps around, and, and if you're a Dunedinite, you can start to spot your granny's house or uh, you know the various um, aspects of the physical geography of, of 1946 Dunedin. The end covers to move from back to, well, actually the photograph was done by my great buddy Bob Simpson from in Cardinal. I just asked him to snap a few shots of me in the back garden. He had no idea that I was planning to use one for that photo, but it, 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 uh, I'm very pleased with it, um, and I think so is he. The end papers are a story in themselves. They are um, the original designs for the 1885 building, opened in 1885, built from 1882, which of course I was able to see when the doors were open, which is quite nice, but we can all see from just about any decent vantage point in Dunedin. And they're in Lawson's hand, and they're signed by the builder, Carlton. And when I discovered them, I had to have them. I couldn't imagine this book appearing without them. And it took a great deal of patience and perseverance and advocacy before permission was finally granted for their use. Uh, and I think that that was only appropriate because um, the, the family, the Salmon family, who generously allowed them to be reproduced, have a very intimate connection with the school, but um, they are splendid uh, illustrations. And in fact, in the color supplement, I reproduce them in color. So uh, the covers, don't judge them by the, the book by its covers, but uh, you know, we put quite a bit of work into the choice of cover, the quality of cover, and the end papers. Um, and uh, then we get to, now we get to the index, the really important bit of the book. Um, Austin G, of course, some of you will know him, Dr. Austin G, who's the editor of the um, Settlers Museum uh, newsletter, which, Toitu newsletter, which coincidentally praised the index very, very highly. He had very little to say about the text. And the index is very revelatory because one or two of the things that perforce had to be omitted from the book, not censored, but by agreement were omitted, strangely enough, are still in the index. So how that happened is beyond me. And there, there is the odd mistake in the index. I just let you know that. So um, um, when you scribble something down, it's probably best to be careful to make it legible. Cap oh, yeah, captions to group photographs, that's the next thing in line. Now, lots of group photos, but I think we made a collective decision, Austin and I, to put the names at the very back. And that, so you don't clutter up the book, but names are very important. And the index is superb in that it lists just about everyone who is mentioned. So that's a great genealogical tool. It makes the book, it gives it an added significance. And to me, it was important because I, when I was asked to do the book, we came to an agreement on the way I would do it. And what was most important to me was that I would write across the board history. I would not focus on the modern period, but that every generation would get an equal amount of attention so that the names that now mean nothing, and I, the latest review on Nick Reed's book blog is rather um, condescending about the fact that he doesn't recognize any of the names or the events, but you know, that's what happens when it's 150 years of history. You, you're only been alive for 40 of them. So, um, that meant that it was uh, quite a challenge to go back to the 1860s and 70s and 80s and write as 
carefully and hopefully as accurately as on the 1960s and 70s on which everyone knows, uh, and that has its own challenge. And that was why the, the next bit, the sources, the footnotes, are so important to me, and the note on sources in which I give belated and rather inadequate thanks to the people who helped me to get access to the sources without which the book would be inadequate. Um, I, I was not able, for reasons known only to the management of the project of Lily Settler's Museum, to get access, adequate access to their uh, it, priceless um, holdings of the papers of the founding fathers of the school. That meant I was more reliant on the work of people like Olive Trotter, who, who's written two marvelous books that I know of, possibly other books, but one on uh, J.C.L. Richardson, the former provincial superintendent, and also um, uh, the wonderful uh, John Grant, uh, her book Spiteful Socrates, um, the man who went to his grave convinced that he'd been cheated of his rightful place as the first rector of the high school, and it was with some uh, pleasure that I gave him the very first word in the book, the quote that starts the book. So Olive Trotter was magnificent, but the Hocken Library were, were exceptional. Each chapter is deeply footnoted, uh, as it should be in a history, and the source that was of most use to me was the, were the papers of the, the High School Board of Governors. Founded in 1878, uh, disestablished with the arrival of tomorrow's schools uh, 110 years later, all stored in the Hocken, and I had tremendous help and support and uh, advice from the Hocken. Their approach to me was, you know what you're doing, but how can we help you do it? I will not attempt to characterize the approach of the 22 early Settlers Museum, but um, because we buried the hatchet, and uh, <laughs> I, I look forward to working there one day again, uh, or at least for the first time. So, um, so much for the sources, um, captions, footnotes. I mean, 50 pages of footnotes. So, um, thankfully, Ed Austin managed to reduce those to 26 pages. But it's it's an unusual institution that will run to that sort of extravagance. And uh, I suppose I, you know, I, I tip my hat to the school. They, they did foot the bill for that, and it, it is... Um, Another organization would have said, well, that's sort of irrelevant, it's paraphernalia, it's, it's let's just say you, you've got everything from, from the Hocken. And, and, um, we didn't have an argument over that, but, but I'm, and I'm glad, but I'm, what I'm suggesting is they might have, have jibbed at all of that, um, that stuff that I insisted on having in the book. Um, the appendices that I mentioned earlier, there are five of them. And I was expecting trouble, especially with the last one, which is a very poignant and rather painful account by a, a boy from the 1980s of his terrible years at Otago Boys. He was gay, and he was he was persecuted for it. He's since become a very uh, senior and influential teacher of English in Britain, and he has a blog, and uh, he generously allowed me to reproduce from his blog uh, an account of his school days. And I think that the book was strong, that is stronger for that. It's not that I've gone out of my way to look for diversity or controversy, but I needed to convey that aspect of this school, as of most boys' schools, I suspect, and his generosity allowed me to do that, I feel, um, just about adequately. Um, the next, uh, uh, going, working backwards, the, uh, uh, Appendix 4 is a wonderful account by a lad called Grant Fletcher of a, a rescue uh, that the boys collectively undertook of a boy who was injured badly on uh, a tramp up at Mount Aspiring in the early days of the, the, the lodge experience. And uh, he wrote about it so brilliantly from Switzerland where he runs an adventure tour company. So the lessons that he learned at school, but when school was at play, had a practical influence on, not just on him, but I'm sure on gen generations of boys since 73, um, since, and I think somewhere in the book I say that, that the Mount Aspiring Lodge is probably the most significant development 
in uh, Otago Boys' modern history. Uh, it was a sort of no man's land where the hitherto opposing forces of pupil and teacher could fraternize nervously at first and on both sides and um, first names could be used, a little leniency, a little toleration. Everybody seemed to be more human than they imagined and uh, almost every boy who's written about it and 400 boys did write to me about their school experiences wrote about it positively. There was one boy, interestingly enough, who, who uh, I have to find it now, who um, did not have a happy experience and, and uh, I couldn't resist ending the little bit that I wrote, three pages or two and a half pages that I wrote on, on, on the lodge on, um, with his quote and his uh, name was Robert Gale and he said, Robert Gale, oh, not, of course not everyone had fond memories, Robert Gale summed up his miserable experience pissed down with rain for damn near the whole week, damn near starved and damn near drowned. <laughs> and that, that came at the end of two and a half pages where I described how the whole lot, the creation of the lodge, the garnering of resources, the, the building of the, the, the structure, the, the, um, the, the, the whole cooperative nature of parents and, and teachers and boys was helped to bind the school and give it a common purpose, two and a half pages. And I got more flat for that one half a sentence. Mm -hmm. And a couple of teachers said, all he had to say about no aspiring was this negativity. And I thought, wow, it's amazing how some people really will only see what they want to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, 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 it is a negative comment. I, I had to put my hand up for that. But the, that, um, that, ex that uh, account by Grant Fletcher was worth its weight in gold. And again, um, uh, getting on to uh, Ross Grimmett's contribution, which is Appendix 2, Ross was very generous in allowing me to reproduce his memories of his uh, boyhood uh, at the school in the early 1950s. And that was really valuable to me, not so much for what he said, but it allowed me then in the chapter on Ted Aang, the chapter from uh, really on the school at Ted Aang, because uh, despite what Nick reads thinks in his blog, the, 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 the chapters are headed with the names of the rectors, but they're not all about the rectors. They're about that period in charge, what happened during those terminal dates, and um, what happened in Ted Ames' uh, terminal dates from 1948 to 63, when he, he actually died in office, was a bit of a mess, a bit of a disaster. It was a war between staff, uh, staff and rector, and I had to write about that and analyze that. That was the big challenge of the book for the modern period. And Ross generously allowing me to use all his words in an appendix, and all he got for it was a thanks. When I attempted to give him a copy of the book, he had it, he already said, oh, we got one. Um, so that uh, is a death of honor that I am very conscious of. There's a, tuck, a little bit on the tuck shop. I think that's appendix uh, two. Um, and that's really enlivened by a couple of wonderful photographs. One by Richard McElray, the, a lad who now, I think, is the coroner in Christchurch, but he was the school photographer unofficial in 62. And he snapped the only photograph of Flo, Florence Roberts, young Flo. A woman, very few women involved in the school history. I tried to get as many as I could in the book, but Flo would have been somebody the boys would have seen every day, sometimes more than once, because it was the tuck shop, that was where you looked across and you got your custard squares and your, and your pies and your cider and all the things that boys invariably reminisce about. And so that photograph was very valuable to me. The tuck shop photo itself, it was only in the last couple of weeks before we went to press that Gary Blackman found his brilliant photograph of the tuck shop. Otherwise, we really didn't have one. It's that old story of the, the item that's in everyday use, that's, that's the one that doesn't get um, Can I just ask a question? Yes. I see that the tax shop was on the corner of Arthur Street, at the top of Cargill Street. Was it owned by the school or was it just it had to be a shop? 
No, it was um, it was there as a tuck shop before the school was there. What happened was when the school was being built, as when in, in, in 1862, as in 1882, a cluster of, of little satellite businesses got ready, prep schools, uh, uh, suppliers, and the tuck shop. So the tuck shop dates from 1884. It was Mrs. Bernicke's, uh Place. Bond, Mrs. Bond, as the boys called it, um, and uh, she gave it away in about 1916, and then the Robertsons took over for, in about 1919, the, the mother and daughter, old Flo and young Flo, so boys have got very good. Maybe three letters is as much of a nickname as they're <laughs> capable of giving to a, to a woman, but Mrs. Bond and, and old and young Flo, but um, no, the touch shops. We live on that site. Ah, that's so. <laughs> but I was never sure if it was private, but it's obviously more than just an ordinary. Yes, shop. and then the shop was knocked down in the early 70s, I think. Uh, yes. And Gary Blackman got wind of it, and I think he went up there and he took a photo. Possibly on the same occasion as he took a, a wonderful photograph of the janitor's house, which was knocked down in 1971, which had been there since 1886. The rumour was that it had, it was part of the asylum buildings. It wasn't, uh, but it was, it was constructed. So that was on the other side, that was on the school side? That was on the school oh, no. side, that was just to the left yeah. of the gates. Yes. That's where the glass house is now. Um, one day I'm going to forget all these details. <laughs> but, um, so that's the touch shop. Um, the, the two other appendices are, were uh, labours of love. Uh, one was on, on Blobs Anderson, this magnificently eccentric um, teacher who was there from 1926 to 1960. And uh, there are legions of stories about Blobs. Most of them, I have no doubt, quite true, because he was a deliberately eccentric and unusual man. And I took some trouble, with Austin's help, to try and um, and, and oh, I have to say, with the help of Alan Alty, my friend in Christchurch, who tracked down the will of James Lawrence Anderson, which was very revealing. It, it threw up two daughters and, uh, and, and various possessions that we didn't know he had. Um, so that was, a, you know, that was great to do that. And when I went to see the Christchurch old boys to explain to them why there was no book, I read them the appendix uh, on blogs, and half of it they loved because they knew it. They knew those stories. And the other half, they were fascinated by because Blobs turns out to be the, the children of, of working class London parents, upholsterers, for God's sake. How the hell does he get to Cambridge? To get an MA from Cambridge and to, be a, to, to, to enter the church. And he was a, a, the Reverend Blobs Anderson. It wasn't a, uh, an assumed title to, to get an inheritance. But, uh, so the truth was stranger than the fiction that the boys loved to weave about Blobs. That Blobs was one of these wonderful characters who can take a joke and can make himself a joke, but can teach through that. He was a nightmare of the inspector, of course. He was on the, uh, the verge of losing his job several times. And um, of course the, the rectors, of successive rectors, worried that their senior uh, staff, uh, science master, who really should be in Blobs' job, top job, would go off somewhere else while waiting for Blobs to, to be sacked or to retire. And luckily, Jock McChesney didn't uh, lose patience, so that would have been a real tragedy. Because whatever his limitations, Jock was a splendid teacher. Did you have a photo of him? Of Blobs. Mm -hmm. um, I had a very grainy, blurry photo of Blobs, but I decided to use about 27 illustrations by the boys. Yes. So he is the most caricatured mm -hmm. man, and I think he's there, he's in the book uh, about you know, so many times. Uh, probably not enough. So, um, and then finally, the, the first appendix is, is on a, a man who epitomizes the school. He was, he was called, um, let's see if I can remember his real name, but he was known as Barney Campbell. Help me out here, Austin. Um, F. H. Campbell. Um, he, he was a pupil at the school from 1883 to 
1889. And when he got there, he was joshing with another lad in his class and, and called him Barney. And then the lad called him Barney. And for some reason, that name stuck forever. He was known as Barney Campbell. But his association with the school, pupil in 1883, head boy, captain of the first 11, captain of the first 15 in 1887, 88. He comes back on the staff in about 1893. He's there till 1934. He is, the only thing he doesn't do is cadets. Everything else is Barney Campbell. All the school sports, the magazine, everything. When he retires, supposedly, in 1934, well, he's the chairman of the, uh, president of the old boys, he's on the board of governors, he's made life governor, he comes back as acting rector in 43 when Kitson's called up. He dies in 1947. So he is a consummate old boy. But he is a flawed hero. He, when when, when um, Campbell House, which of course was named after him because he was for uh, what, 18 years the manager of the Campbell House, which was the school hostel, uh, now known as Schoolhouse, it's known as Schoolhouse because none of the wealthy old boys who were prepared to put their hands in their pockets to fund a schoolhouse would do so if it were to remain Campbell House because they knew Barney and they did not like Barney. So the appendix is gives a flavor of why they didn't like Barney. When he retired in 1934, everybody said, well, Barney, write your autobiography. You know more about the school than anybody. And that was true. And Barney did. He wrote, he wrote a memoir. And that memoir took revenge on every single person who crossed him. From the first rector Henry Belcher, he gave the goods on Henry Belcher. And when I discovered the memoir, I thought, oh, this is brilliant. Because I'd already come to those conclusions about Belcher. And I tried to convey them. And it was only late on that I, that I, that I discovered Barney's memoir, which had been mined by various uh, magazine editors, notably um, Baby Arnold. Uh, Theo Arnold, but had been sort of a little bit too hot to handle. And the best bit, which I decided to quote verbatim, and possibly this again might have been Austin's idea in the appendix one, was a story that Barney told, and you could see the indignation dripping off his pen as he was writing it. It was the story of how he had told Sandy Wilson in 1904 that this boy, Leslie Hatton Wetter, was trouble. He was incorrigible. He would not correct his handwriting. Barney had punished him, but he would not, he wouldn't change. This boy was frustrating to Barney. And Barney beat him regularly, as teachers did to boys. In 1904, Wetton was 15, and he was a big boy. And he was in detention for his handwriting yet again. And on his detention card, he wrote in shorthand, what rot. Rebellious boy. Well, Barney checks the detention cards. He goes into the car, he sees this. And, of course, he sees red. So the boy, now, now you know, he's getting the cane, he's going to thrash this boy again. But the boy waits until he lifts the cane, swings around, and decks it. Gives, puts, he has to go down to the hospital and have his lips stitched. He has a scar. This is silly. He picks, by the time he picks himself up, the boy's gone, he's gone. Anyway, <laughs> so he marches into Sandy Wilson's office. And he says, basically, I told you this boy was I told you, you know. And you know, this is going to be expelled. So he's expelled. Barney's, uh, he won't listen. The, the, the boy comes to apologize. The father comes to. The father's a teacher. No. And Barney says to the director, Wilson, you know, if he tries to come to, to, to prize giving, he's not to come. You know, I won't stand for it. Of course, the Sandy's in honor of the boy. The boy does come, sits with his mates. You know, Barney gets up. This is a big set piece of the school year in 1904, as in 2014. He leaves the stage. He will not come back until that boy's expected. <laughs> anyway, and he writes all this down, and I thought, wonderful. So I just reproduced it in his exact words. And then Austin tapped me on the shoulder and said, This guy, Leslie Hatton Quetta, now some idiot. Has misidentified him in the uh, in the um, 
the, the Otago Medical School uh, history, but you know we won't identify who that who did the index for that book. But when we discovered who he was, Austin decided to track him. <coughs> well, he becomes a doctor with that bad handwriting at all, <laughs> and he accompanied Sir Douglas Mawson on two Antarctic expeditions, and he is an absolute disaster. He is all the things as an adult that Barney Campbell has spotted as a boy. And the best, I, I think it's the best bit of writing in the book, is the last paragraph of the appendix. One, and I can say that because I didn't write it because Austin wrote it. I got paid for writing this book, but Austin wrote this last bit. And um, it's worth, it's worth um, reading. The boy concerned was Leslie Hatton Wetter listed in the 1963 register as follows. At school, 1934, quite rather short. MB, CHB, 1910, surgeon, Matt Carmen Northwater, died 1955. Soon after his graduation, Quetta became a member of Sir Douglas Mawson's Australasian Antarctic Expedition of 1911-14. His sledge party discovered the first meteorite to be found in Antarctica and a rocky outcrop, the Quetta Nunatak, that was named after him. As Mawson's Antarctic Diaries, published in Sydney in 1988, reveal, Quetta frequently clashed with Mawson, who found him to be work shy. For his part, Quetta believed he and his colleagues were being overworked. He had planned to use his time in the Antarctic to study for his examinations for a fellowship in the Royal College of Surgeons. <laughs> he dodged even the lightest, the relatively light duties assigned to him. When Mawson asked why he had joined the expedition in the first place, Quetta replied, not to do such kind of work. Mawson called him a bloody fool to have come on the expedition if that was the case. The response came, bloody fool yourself, I won't be caught on another one. <laughs> Everybody else works continuously whilst he camps, complained Mawson, who eventually confronted Wetter. I showed him that he was entirely unfit for an expedition, chiefly through lack of determination in character, and failing to do his level best towards the interests of the expedition. I can hear Barney chuckling now. As usual, he attempted to make light of all the charges and seemed to think my opinion of little value. In fact, Quetta's mother had earlier warned Mawson against taking her son on the expedition. And, and Austin found this other little gem. Quetta had other failings apart from laziness. On one occasion, a bottle of port was found to have been drunk secretly on the expedition. That's, you know, that's against all the rules. So Mawson added some croton oil, a powerful <laughs> purgative, to another bottle. A few days later, it became apparent that Quetta had drunk it. So, that, was, um, that was great. That was great. That, that bit. So there, there are the appendices, which uh, you know, which no one has actually mentioned to me, or mm -hmm. I don't think they need to read it. But that's the that's the that's at the end of 160,000 words, and um, so the last two chapters are, are, are were written by the current and the the, um, the this, his predecessor, current rector and his predecessor, um, Michael McMillan and Clive Rennie. They're not intended as as any more than raw material for the next history, I, I was, uh, it was agreed uh, that I wouldn't write about what's really current politics, although um, I regret greatly uh, that decision now, because I feel that the, the, um, the, the penultimate chapter is, um, is, is not worth reading, and uh, I should have done a, a lot better with that, but I didn't really that that would be the case so, um, until much too late. But the book up to 1986 is, is mine and I'll, I'll stand by it. And it, it has been a little controversial, but I think that the, the school, as I said, the launch deserves a lot of credit for employing a complete outsider, for having, for most of the time, uh, the trust to, to let that person get on with the job and for publishing eventually um, the findings and what I regard as um, a, 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 you know, a book that I've written without fear or failure, as I say in the acknowledgments. It hasn't been censored. One image was, was omitted, um, and uh, that was the only thing that was done 
it was done with my agreement in the end, but I did have some arguments against it, which were, against the omission of that image, which weren't considered. So I'm, I'm not all that happy about that. Um, what was the image? It was a, it was a uh, poster that was on every street corner in every uh, major city in May 1983. It was a truth. Uh, billboard and it said um, Lady Die to meet Randy Rector. So it referred to the, the uh, Do Donald James McLaughlin's uh, alleged affair with a member of the staff which was settled out of court by a confidential settlement but which was subsequently exposed repeatedly and memorably because just about everyone I've spoken to can tell me all about it in truth over the previous two years before the arrival of Prince Charles and his then wife, and there were three in that marriage, as we now know as well, but we'll let that one pass. Um, and they were reopening the school in 1983. So it was quite, it was an embarrassing personal lapse. It, if it had been not blown up in the press, it wouldn't have been in the history. It was a public affair, the school was affected. And I followed through that duty to see what, what happened, how did it happen, what effect did it have on the school. And then I allowed myself one paragraph of the four uh, in which I said, possibly if you read between the lines, what should have happened. And, uh, but, so that's caused a little controversy, but I think that um, you know, um, you've know got 150 years of history. Um, I think in, in most institutions that, that are the old skeleton, I think it's, it, it, uh, and the school, to be fair, has never really suggested that it would be omitted entirely, but um, there's a debate on what's appropriate, and, and, um, and that's good, it's good to have a debate, but um, when you have a history, there are, um, the word history, there are um, things that can be done and can't be done, and so if it, was, if it had been censored, changed without my agreement, that would not have been uh, acceptable to me. But it hasn't been, so I'm very pleased that that's the case because I'm hoping to be able to promote it this this year. I'm hoping that it will um, have a bit of a future. And if nothing else, um, you know, it'll be, uh, all the files are in the, that will be in the hocking for the next historian to mull over. Just one thing, you said mm -hmm. Donald Rockland's alleged affair. Can you just be careful with it? Uh, no, I, um, I, I said that the, the um, truth reported the affair. Um, uh, it was put to me by Don McLaughlin's son that his father had, n had never admitted the affair. I pointed out to him that it was usual in these cases, although I was no lawyer, he did have his lawyer sitting next to him, that it was usual for the person to deny that which his father had not done. Um, but I put in a ledge, having made that little point, I put in a ledge, and now I say a ledge. I, I, I have no interest in whether or not there was an affair. I think. Is that one of the things that helped them? I don't know. I, I'm, uh, I, I was at a loss to understand why it wasn't published in time for the 150th. Um, I thought it was held up. So. It was held up, yeah, well, the, the thing... Because there were, yeah. there were one or two... Yeah, that was one of that was one of them. I, that was made. Of, I, I think essentially, and it's hard to read other people's minds, but I think my approach has been an objective approach, so that rather than positive or negative, um, I've tried to look at the, the school squarely and fairly. Um, so the boys' voices are very loud in the later chapters. They were four hundred of them were very generous about letting me know their school <coughs> in their maturity, they were uh, reminiscing either on tape or... So I, I wouldn't have that censored. And a lot of that, I was told, was perceived as negative. Um, I don't see that. I don't see that. It's a boys' school. There, there's bullying, there's homophobia, there's, there's also tremendous camaraderie, there's tremendous sporting issues. There's failure. There's, there's, it's all there, and most of it in the latter chapters is reference to boys' quotes. So, um, 
I think that is fundamentally the reason why one or two people who have the say so over whether or not it would be published and how soon it would be published had hesitations. They're very present minded people, and rightly so. They're thinking about the school's reputation, rightly so. Um, so but we came to an agreement and understanding. Some of which I can't talk about because I'm legally bound not to. But no, but um, any other questions? That's, I, I didn't mean to ramble on and on, and I meant to show you some photos, but they're just a couple of photos from the book, so. Um. Excuse my ignorance, but was this McLaughlin um, one, one of the rectors? Well, most people will have known him. He was the second longest serving rector from 1963 to 86 son of a Presbyterian minister, a, a very successful rector, uh, and um, under his auspices, as I think I say in the last uh, paragraph, uh, the school was changed beyond recognition, uh, completely rebuilt. Um, uh, no, amazing things happened under his brief, and uh, a lot of them he deserves credit for. And I, I do give him that credit. He, I interviewed him two hours and uh, I, I should, it was a waste of energy, everything was marvellous. <laughs> the boys were marvellous, the board was marvellous, the uh, teachers I, were marvellous. I see a photograph the other day and he, he actually resigned. Mm. But what, how, how many years had he been there? 23. And he resigned because of the scandal? No, not at all. Oh. He resigned um, two years after it, uh, he had this little I mean, his attitude to it was that he'd done nothing that he need to um, resign for or even apologize for. His attitude was um, remarkable. He, he, couldn't, uh, he couldn't have survived today. He wouldn't talk to me about it. I did ask him about it. Uh, but his attitude to it wasn't important to me. But the boy's attitude was, and the staff and the board's attitude was, and the community's attitude. Because in a sense, what I was trying to do, or I hope I have achieved, is explain the school to the wider community to show where some of the traditions come from, where some of the attitudes come from, and I do characterize them, uh, often in the person's own words, Ted Aim and McLaughlin especially. I'm so pleased I didn't have to do that with Michael McMillan, otherwise we would still be do we know why talking to lawyers. Do we know why he was on? It wasn't a scandal. Um, well, he was 60 oh, years of age. Oh. And, you know, um, but no, oh, you enjoyed the chapter. It's the longest chapter in the book. Any questions? Uh, Rory, how many books have sold to date that you know about for what Well, they should have sold out by now, but uh, because we missed the 150th, we lost a thousand sales straight away. Uh, but um, I, I dare say they've moved about a thousand. Uh, there'll be 500 left. I'm hoping for a big boost of sales in the middle of the year. But that's in the lap of the gods. Or Tony Simpson, Kim Hill, and the other three judges of the New Zealand Post Book Award. Because that would be, if it got on the shortlist, would be a tremendous boost of publicity. But I can't seem to, because it's a commissioned history and it's published by the school, I took it up to Auckland and I went to the academic buyer for Whitworth who was somewhat surprised to see me because she'd given me the brush off on the phone. But I gave her the book and I, and she gave it back to me and I, you know, she said, no, if somebody orders it in the sort of Dunedin North branch, we'll, we'll order a copy because they will only deal through book distributors. They only deal with big books. And then she finally couldn't resist asking me why I had come to see her when she pretty much told me on the summer phone. And I said I wanted to be able to say that she handed me back the book without even opening it. So I'm really hoping that I'll get to use that line later on because without Whitcombs, you cannot sell a book in any quantity. And they won't order a book like this. So it's really it's a catch-22. <laughs> but the other bookshops shop, have been great. UBS, Paper Plus, the books going through steadily for them. And, I mean, they get it for 50 and sell it for 75, so it's a pretty good uh, deal for them. Um, the person who's really paid the price for the book is a, ge a generous Macau millionaire who's uh, subsidised the thing massively. 
Are you on to a new project now? I'm in recovery. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And are you the product of a voice for yourself? What was yes. your like? Yes. Okay. And um, when I was discussing the approach I take with the, the foundation of the Tiger Boys High School, which is basically a sort of a fundraising body, and so they are the ones who commissioned the book, and I dealt with them through the rector. Um, I said that I would, I actually said to them not to give me the job, but to advertise the job, and I would apply for it, make up their mind what sort of book they wanted. I told them how much it would cost. Advertise, I would apply, but the sort of book I would write would be a political book because I'm a political historian. But I'd write the sort of book that I wanted to read about my old school that said not just who were the good and bad teachers, but why were they good, in what ways were they bad, and what was memorable about the school, and what changes, and what did the school, in a sense, what did the school give you? you know, and then I can track that back. And there are teachers who, I mean, I won't name the ones that are, but it's very clear. And there are many, many of them. My one regret, big regret, with McLaughlin chapter is that I was so focused on probing the things that McLaughlin would not talk to me about that I probably have not given the staff of that long period their full due, and I'm aware of that. But I did run it past about 30 of them in the chapter, and they pretty much, with one exception, said that is recognisably the school that I've been at for 20 years, so I thought that's good enough for me. And so uh, that was great because I was able to withstand quite a strong challenge to have that in chapter entirely rewritten, um, which was what really held the thing up. So any, uh, how many of the Otago High School old boys here? One, six, Seen anything of the book? Um, does it ring true, or are you yet to open its covers? Yet to open its covers. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, it was a great, let me tell you, uh, as representing a type of boys, that it was a great privilege to write this book, and I, I won't write a more uh, significant, or to me, a more personal book. Um, I felt the weight of not just the 400 people who wrote to me, but all those people who have long gone but who felt just as strongly about the school, sometimes negatively, but mostly a bit negative, a bit positive, but the school had a real influence on them. And that was what I tried to convey in writing it. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. It's like a slow burner, you know, when, when people get around to reading it and, and uh, hopefully um, it'll, um, you know, people's work, not just my work, but other, other people's work will be appreciated. Mr. McCall sponsor an old boy? Oh, very much so. Uh -huh. In the 1970s, It's very difficult to write a book uh, of that sort of magnitude without um, quite a bit of money. I mean, it was an expensive, Austin's bill of money was
missing your parents? It always amused me that they brought the school next to a lunatic asylum. Did that come up anywhere? Well, they 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 occupied the grounds. They replaced the lunatic asylum. In fact, they built the school and they built the gymnasium while the lunatics, as they were known then, still were occupying the premises. And the gymnasium, designed by Robert Lawson, wasn't a survival from the asylum, as even a so clever an historian as, as Willie Morrill thought uh, in his memoirs, but it was a purpose-built building, and it was kitted up as accommodation for the lunatics until they all went to their new home in Seacliff. Uh, so Lawson was supervising and overseeing both projects, which I, I hint um, might have had something to do with a little bit of lack of attention over drainage matters, which came back to be a serious problem, to say the least. But uh, no, the, the joke was, of course, that the lunatic had inmates. But, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I haven't read it yet either. But how did it fit into the uh, mores or the, the standards of education uh, in comparison to other schools in New Zealand? Well, that's the thing. Um, there were very few other schools. It's the fourth oldest secondary school in New Zealand. So it was very much an importation. And it was more Anglican than... than uh, and, and English than Presbyterian and Scots to begin with, uh, which caused problems for the first couple of rectors, two of whom were actually in holy orders, uh, which you pretty much had to be to go, and, uh, go through Oxbridge in those days. Um, so there were tensions to do with, uh, well, with sectarianism, with, with um, I mean, one rector famously, uh, Frank Simmons, uh, unburdened himself to his uh, to a, a bishop in uh, Scotland, an Anglican bishop, um, of his opinion that Presbyterianism was the driest and least humane of religions, <laughs> and uh, amongst other things, uh, referring to Scotland as that priest-ridden country. And that letter came back by a circuitous route <coughs> to the Dunedin press, and the man was hounded out of the job. He went to Nelson College, where he promptly uh, had such stunning scholarship successes that his successor was then having a doubt of his job, Stuart Hawthorne. So the early histories of the rectors are uh, mm -hmm. a very doleful uh, account. And J. J. T. S. Grant from the sidelines saying, "I told you so." As a curse on them, they took my job. Mm -hmm. The first rector, of course, infamously and tragically drowned with his entire family on uh, the day after he arrived. in uh, the infant settlement as it was then in July 1863. But that was, that was a gift to me, I've got to say, because most everybody believed that he drowned on arrival. But he, in fact, and his wife had a, a whole day in Dunedin to plan the christening of their infant child the next Sunday at the first St. Paul's to, to inspect the school, to meet the Board of Governors, to not the Board of Government, the Board of Education then, and um, tragically took the advice of the harbour master that evening to go back and transship his luggage and his infant family and their wife and two servants, the third fortunately went over land, onto a little paddle steamer and went smack into another steamer that evening, eight o'clock, and it was a winter's dark, cold evening, and they drowned. Biggest funeral than even had ever seen. And we didn't see another one like it. Because, of course, there'd been great anticipation about him coming out again, but he was a scholar and a tragedy of his little family. Five of them under five or under six. It's a lovely little um, painting by John Pinder. What can Mm. I've never seen that before. That's Rather romantic. Isn't yeah. it? Mm. Yeah. No, the illustration, I've got to say that the Settlers Museum were very cooperative in providing illustrations. I have that, that has to be said. Uh, with my phone.
photographic research that we did. We did. And what was the problem? Uh, the problem was that they decided to close for two years because they needed to do 50 million ratepayers' money. But in, during that time, the staff were allocated not to um, researchers uh, but to other jobs. Although I was offered two days access over the two years, a total of six hours to about 35 million meters of research.